On March 22, 2022, the number of known exoplanets passed 5,000. The animation and sonification you're watching here tracks humanity's discovery of the planets beyond our solar system over time. Turning NASA data into sounds allows you to hear the pace of discovery. As each exoplanet is discovered, a circle appears at its position in the sky. The music is created by playing a note for each newly discovered world. Sarah Seeger, astrophysicist and planetary scientist from MIT, joins me to talk about how she navigates politics in the science community, and does she think that we're alone in the universe? Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Sarah, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. Uh, I've been wanting to speak with you for a really long time, and I do admire your work and the research that you're doing as a planetary physicist and all the exoplanet work that you've done. And you. I'm also a Canadian myself. So, I can hear your, <laughs> so actually, many... believe it or not, I can hear it in your accent. Can you? There you go. That makes yeah. sense. I, the occasionally about or about, uh, or the A comes through pretty clearly, I'm told. So, <laughs> uh, with that said, you know, working in the Canadian space and starting in the Canadian space, I should say, and then moving to work with MIT, how did you navigate that as a Canadian and then moving into an American system uh, working within science? Well, I moved to the United States for graduate school, so it was kind of a natural pro progression once I was here. Awesome. And then what were those catalyst moments that kind of changed your career trajectory to where you are now. Can you, um, well, I'll you just, just give one that like started out because it has a Canadian heritage and that is, believe it or not, it was supernova 1987A, which was discovered by a Canadian actually. And it was amazing because a supernova is an exploding star yep. that's visible by the naked eye, but not here in the Northern hemisphere. This particular one started in the Southern hemisphere, but I was a teenager at the time and it made the news and it was like a really big deal. And it really kind of pushed my interest from just dormant to something active and it was like an amazing moment so that was I'd say like a uh, that was kind of an initiation type of <laughs> milestone nice and then just getting to MIT like how did you find your trajectory trajectory there and then landing there and you know being one of the most respected planetary physicists that are that are working right now in exoplanet research well it's a lot to condense that story into a couple of minutes but for sure. Let yeah. me start at the beginning. Well, yeah, I yeah. went to graduate school uh, in America and I was actually at Harvard University, which has the luxury of being able to let students work on any topic because they have funding to let you kind of branch out. But an amazing thing happened when I was in graduate school. The first reports of planets orbiting stars other than the sun were first reported. And that was amazing because people were highly skeptical that these other objects were actually planets. People thought perhaps it was just a false, an effect of the star itself, which I can go into in more detail if you want. But I jumped to work on the field of exoplanets when given that opportunity by my graduate uh, student advisor. Wonderful. So working on a brand new field like that, it could have gone in any direction, really. Sometimes people take risks that don't pan out. Other times it flourishes beyond your you know, wildest dreams, which is what ended up happening. So fast forward 10 years, when people started taking exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun seriously, and they finally started to realize that maybe there's something here, this might be big. And that's when MIT hired me because they were late in the game and needed to hire someone to get started. Right. 
That makes sense. And there was a lot of, you know, people were pushing back on those theories of exoplanets. I'm, you know, I was going to ask this question later on, but you kind of, you moved me into it now. What is the political, the political climate like right now? Like, what are the debates that are going on currently, you know, even just outside of exoplanets and the new research that's happening? Because what are they pushing back against right now that you feel that might be coming to the forefront as something new and innovative? Mm -hmm. Well, we can unpack that a bit later, but one sure. of the beautiful things about space science is it's somewhat apolitical in that people who love science love space. It's just a unifying experience in a way. So, you know, there's all the politics all around us all the time. Like, should we be spending so much money on space? Is there enough diversity in the workforce in space? But on the whole, people like on all sides, you know, love space. I've testified to the US Congress two separate times and, you know, both sides love it. <laughs> so in some ways we're, we're lucky here. That this yeah. idea of exploration and boots on Mars, everybody wants to see that, return to the moon, just trying to understand what's out there in its own way is inspiring to all people. Yeah, and just, I think the, going back then a little bit to the, one of the original questions I was going to ask you was just about how the universe has the theories of how the universe started, you know, over time, how has your theories then changed from the beginning of when you started in exoplanet research and then where are they currently and, and how did they change and how did they evolve? And did you come to a point where sometimes you were like, Hey, maybe this theory isn't that right. And I need to go into another direction. And how did you go about doing that? Yeah, that's Lots a great of questions. Question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps yeah. I can just sort of speak to the community at large because for sure, yeah. we all learned or hopefully learned, you know, in grade school about our planetary system, our solar system. Do you remember Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars? Yes. Jupiter, Saturn, <laughs> Uranus, well. Neptune, yeah. and then Pluto, which is unfortunately right. no longer officially a planet right now. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of Pluto-like objects out there. So we all learned about that. But what is interesting about our solar system, you know, we have these rocky worlds close to our sun and Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they're pretty far away, actually. So in searching for other planetary systems, everybody just expected to find solar system copies. And guess how many solar system copies we found? Well, 5,000 to date that I know well, we of. We found 5,000. Exoplanets, yeah. sorry. Exoplanets that, was date, right? that was a bit of a trick question. That was a bit of a trick question. That was a trick question, Sarah. <laughs> we have found 5,000, over 5,000 exoplanets, but how many yeah. of these resemble our solar system? And the answer is almost none of them, actually. Wow. And so, for example, initially, people discovered planets that were many times closer to their star than Mercury is to our sun. Wow. Which makes no sense because to have like a Jupiter mass object right up tight with its star, there's not enough material there to form a giant planet. And so the theory of how planetary systems formed it basically had to be almost thrown out the window because we were finding lots of types of planetary systems that people never expected. We have some planets, uh, we call them hot super Earths. They're very close to the star. And by Kepler's third law, the closer a planet is, the faster it orbits. And some of these planets are so close to their star they orbit in what their year is half of an earth day. Wow. Yeah, amazing, huh? That's and so yeah. all these kinds of planets, like the most common type of planet out there is a planet two to three times earth size. So Uranus and Neptune are four times, four times the size of earth. So something about half that size. And there's nothing like it in our own solar system, yet it appears to be the most common type of planet out there. And we don't know what it's made of or how it formed. So you had a good question because the theories are constantly evolving. Like we're a bit lost in a way. It sort of reminds me of when, you know, if your closet is so messy and it's full of stuff, you have to take everything out before you can like organize and put it all back together. And right now we're in that phase where we took everything out and it's like a giant mess. <laughs> Then you got to figure out how you're going to reorganize. Yeah. You know, reorganize. And with that said, like, what, what are you looking to, like, is there any way or any tactics that you guys have to kind of organize that closet right now that you're talking about? Well, we're kind of always hopeful for the next thing. So one of the big deal things now is that the James Webb Space Telescope launched on Christmas morning of this past year of 2021. Right. Yeah. And so everyone woke up early. I was actually on the West Coast and we woke up at 4 a.m., 4 a.m. to see it launch. Wow. And it was amazing and breathtaking. Well, the kind of hope is that with this James Webb Space Telescope, it's able to study atmospheres of exoplanets. And by doing that, we hope to have more information about specific individual planets. It might help us to understand what they're made of 
it's going to be a bit tricky, but that could help us understand what they're made of and therefore possibly how they formed. Yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm super excited to see the photographs that are going to be coming back from James Webb or the information that's coming back with that said, then, you know, moving forward. And this comes to my ignorance then as well is looking at photographs, then like actual images of exoplanets, like where are we and how close are we to something like that? Good question. Are you thinking of an image like the beautiful Apollo images of earth, or are you thinking of an image like just a dot, like these stars in my background picture or both would be, you know, obviously an Apollo image would be great. <laughs> that would, yeah. uh, that would be something that we would love, but even both, like how close are we sure, to sure. say like, Hey, yeah. Like we've seen our little pale blue dot as Carl Sagan would say, but you know, how close are we saying mm -hmm. to one of those dots so, out there? Yeah. It's, a, it's, there's good news and bad news. I mean, okay. the, the bad news is that we're very far, we're probably decades away from seeing a pale blue dot, like our own earth, earth out there. The good news is we have a different type of planet. Think of like an Earth cousin rather than an Earth twin. And small planets that happen to go in front of their host uh, small red dwarf stars, we can access those sooner. It won't be an image though. It'll be, I like how you said information, which we can just kind of use to not describe it in any detail, but we can get information about the atmospheres of some of these small rocky planets around small red dwarf stars. So we can do that with the James Webb Space Telescope. The pale blue dot will have to wait. We know how to do it. It just, we don't have money and it will take time. But can we jump for ahead in the future? Because yeah, this idea of like that. an Apollo image of another world, it's so breathtakingly exciting, but it's so hard, 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 hard. But I want to share with you one idea on how the community might do that in the distant future. Yeah, I love that. Go for it. Well, there's a field called gravitational lensing, right? And that is like mass bend space. So if you remember, like Einstein became super famous because he predicted that stars uh, behind our sun, the light would bend around the sun. So think about the rays from a star going in all directions. If there's like a lens in front of it, you know, the lens focuses that light to you. And our sun can act like a lens so that what Einstein predicted was during a solar eclipse, a star would appear in a different position than when there's no, you know, than during the night sky when the sun's not around. Right. But I want you to think of our sun as a giant lens for a background exoplanet orbiting its star. So imagine wow. you can send a spacecraft uh, 500 times the Earth's sun distance, but lining up with the sun. So the sun is in front of like a distant known exoplanet. We could use that sun and those distances to use the sun like, like a magnifying glass, if you will. Wow. And to magnify that background planet so that we could reconstruct like an Apollo-like image of Earth at like 10 kilometers scale on the planet. That's unbelievable. And, and also I believe the Hubble Space Telescope is using gravitational lensing in its recent image that it released. Yes, exactly. I Hubble believe. is using yeah. gravitational lensing for distant galaxies that are so far away, we would not see them unless like a foreground galaxy cluster can act as a lens. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I've been learning so much more about gravitational lensing because there's a lot of conversations within the mainstream space about it right now, which I think is really great. It's a crazy really idea, exciting. right? Like think about yeah. using mass to like bend light. It's and rays it's so that smart. would normally go like off into outer space. Those extra rays get focused to you. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, and Really? Yeah. And I, and I'm, I always say to people, I'm so excited and happy that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm growing in a time like this and I'm alive during this time because it's one of the most exciting times ever in history for any of this type of like research and anything that's going on. And, and exoplanets are obviously unbelievable and there's so much more to come, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm going to ask you, and I know I, you've probably been asked this many times too. And, uh, what is your thoughts then on extraterrestrial life? Is, is there other life out there that could be from, you know, smaller life, um, but even something that's more intelligent? Do you, do you follow that? And maybe you can give me the scientific version and then maybe your own opinion as well too. Sure, I can. Um, well, the, my own scientific version is that we don't have any proof of intelligent life anywhere um, aside from us here on earth. <laughs> Some would and... like to differ. <laughs> But when I just think about all the stars out there, like in this night sky behind me, there's a few hundred, but in our darkest night sky, we could see a few thousand, but our galaxy, the Milky Way has hundreds of billions of stars. And thinking about the whole universe, which has hundreds of billions of galaxies, the possibility out there is just so tremendous that even without any hard evidence, we almost have to believe that there is 
life and there's intelligent life somewhere out there. But I love the conversation though, even though I don't believe in intelligent life nearby has ever visited earth. I love to imagine that there is intelligent life somewhere nearby, but maybe it's like dolphins, you know, they don't have hands, they can't build like telescopes or they can't build a way to communicate with us, but there could still be intelligent life. I think my dog is somewhat intelligent. <laughs> we always joke that he's either like one of the dumbest creatures around or he's a super genius, you know, just pretending <laughs> to be dumb because he does get what he wants. It's fair. But you I know what I'm saying? So there could too. be some kind of intelligent yeah. life, but maybe it doesn't have hands to like build things or maybe there's life out there, intelligent life. It just isn't ready to contact us. So I love the, all the, I love thinking about it. But yeah. for me, I don't have evidence that we've seen life. And I'm great that you're open-minded to it. And I think that's, you know, I think a lot of scientists and people should be, and, and I think they are, they just don't always talk about it. Um, and it's nice to see that we're moving into a place where science is opening up to have those conversations and looking for, you know, markers and markers of life. And, and, and with that said, what are those markers that you are looking for when it comes to life and being able to say, Hey, for sure, this is outside of water. Um, that this is something that would be uh, a planet for earth or something that would be able to have intelligent life on it or just life in general. Right. Well, it's definitely a tough business. You know, our, dream is to find a gas on another planet in an atmosphere like oxygen, a gas that doesn't belong there, that could only be there if it's produced in continuous, huge quantities. So in our planet, we have oxygen and we all need oxygen to breathe. But without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, we would have almost no oxygen. It's so reactive. It shouldn't be in our atmosphere at all. So when we let's think about those intelligent aliens around on a planet orbiting a nearby star and imagine that they have not the James Webb, but they have like the next telescope we want to build, the one to find the pale blue dot. Right. And they can see our atmosphere and they see we have oxygen. You know, they'll be very suspicious there's life here. So it's kind of mind boggling. You know, it's not from the Great Wall of China or from city lights or the things we think of as being like superhuman made, but oxygen that and life that re-engineered our atmosphere. So, wow, I mean, there's so many gases other than oxygen that life makes. Like think about when you walk through a pine forest, all those smells, you know, think about that pine smell, Christmas tree smell, that's a gas called isoprene and other gases like it that are made by life. And so we do have this whole menu of options of what we're looking for, but it gets kind of tricky because there are other ways to make these gases that aren't life. <laughs> so if those aliens see oxygen here, they're not gonna be 100% sure. You know, they might be scratching their heads thinking about other ways oxygen might be made. It's hard, there aren't really many. So we're kind of looking for, um, let's say that smoke that indicates there a, was a fire or is a fire, but we're, uh, we're not there yet. And that's fair. Uh, how close do you think we'd be to something like that? Well, I think it's what you said before. It's an exciting time because we're the first ones who can even do this for real. Right. Like people have honestly thought about using oxygen as a sign of life on another body, another world since about 1930. And, you know, it's almost a hundred years and we're the first ones yes. who get to try. So with the Webb telescope, we'll have a few of these so-called earth cousins rocky planets. They're the right temperature for life. And we'll be able to study their atmospheres. I'm gonna hold my breath on it. I'm part of a team that is observing one of these. It's called TRAPPIST-1E, right? And we just found out that the web will be tasked to look at our planet, not this summer, unfortunately, but a year from this summer. So, you know, within a couple of years, we'll be studying these atmospheres of these potentially habitable worlds, but whether the telescope can get the job done or whether it's even there or not is an open question. Yeah. And you brought up, uh, I'm moving all over the place in my questions right now, which is great. Cause you brought up Trappist one, you know, I've, I've read that there is like the density of a cotton candy planet. There's a planet with iron rain. So how do you know this? And then outside of like from gases, I understand that, but then how are they evolving? And then how are they evolving to date? And how do we, how do we know? And how do we find out that information? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Let me explain the cotton candy one. Yeah. So great. You know what? It's we measure the mass of the planet because the planet and star orbit the common center of mass. Or to make it sound a bit easier, you imagine that the planet's gravity tugs on the star and the star wobbles due to a planet orbiting it. From measuring that star wobble, we can 
get the mass of the planet or some you know constraint on the planet mass. If a planet also goes happens to be aligned perfectly, so the planet goes in front of the star as seen from our viewpoint, the starlight drops by a tiny amount when the planet goes in front of the star. And then the star returns to normal when the planet finishes transiting. By that method, we get a radius. And if you want to think about what density is, it's actually mass per volume. Okay. So if we have a mass, we have a size which we can convert to volume, knowing that the planet's a sphere. We just do mass divided by volume and we get an average density. So think about holding cotton candy versus holding like a heavy rock versus holding, I don't know what the heaviest thing you can think of is. Okay, like a weight, like if you're doing um, kettlebells and you've got like a super right. heavy, you know, okay. So you can kind of guess as to what something is. So that's where that comes from. So there are planets, we've measured their mass inside and volume. We can get their density. It's insane that there are planets like so light and fluffy, like overall, it's just crazy. That's where we get it's, that one from. Yeah. And I think the diversity out there, and when you think about it and, you know, my sci-fi mind ends up like drawing these these really elaborate pictures where you're like, how is this, you know, and it's probably not what it looks like. Let's be honest here. Right, right. Well, <laughs> but, I like um, what you're doing it's, because it's what we do yeah. too. Like we have something, yeah. the average density, and then our mind has to fill the rest in, you know, just yeah. like you said, sci-fi, or when you're reading a book, your mind fills in everything else. But these planets with iron rain, well, you know how outside, actually, I'm not sure where you, where, which part of the um, country are you living in? I'm in Toronto currently. Right Toronto, now. okay, great. Yeah. So I was just checking to make sure you were somewhere cold. <laughs> but right. you, know, you go outside <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. winter, right? And that puddle from last night, all of a sudden it's ice. Yeah. But there's planets that are very hot. They're like 1,000, 2,000 Kelvin. They're very hot. You can't have water go to ice, as you know, right? Because when you boil stuff on your stove, like there's no ice there. Right. But there's other materials that go from a liquid to a solid at those very high temperatures. And including iron. So iron can be in like a gas form, but if the temperature is right, it can cross that boundary from gas to solid or gas to liquid. Right. And so it's these hot planets and modeling their atmosphere and seeing that some clouds are blocking the atmosphere and then inferring what those clouds are made of. It can't be made of water because it's too hot, but it can actually be made of iron. It's a crazy idea. It's, it's, it's wild. It's so wild. And like, I love when you're watching TV too, and they have these wonderful shows that are showing like potentially what type of life would be there if it ever did evolve and what it would be like. I think those are, those are really great because it gets people involved and it gets them interested and it gets them thinking about, um, life outside of their own planet. Um, with that said too, there is the Galileo project and Avi Loeb is working on that with Harvard currently. Would you ever consider working and attaching yourself with Avi Loeb and his research right now on the Galileo project? Well, I'm probably not going to attach myself to the Galileo project because I don't, first of all, Avi Loeb's already doing this and he has a big following and he's got funding for it. So he doesn't need any extra people to work on it. I typically leave the search for UFOs to other people. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, that's totally fair. And I, I can understand that. Um, you know, I know there's other research and other affiliates that are working with him, but you know, I respect that a hundred percent, uh, cause there's lots of other people that can research UFOs outside of it too. Um, you're quoted in the CBC saying, uh, a recent article at CBC. And if people don't know that are watching this Canadian, it's a Canadian news outlet, um, very well-respected Canadian news outlet. Uh, and you were said when exoplanets first started 30 years back, people laughed and thought they were, um, the fields that would go nowhere. Uh, and today there's over, you know, 5,000 exoplanets. So can you break down why you felt that the field was, they felt the field was going nowhere in the beginning. And then again, yeah. What was some of those pushbacks that you got, um, when you came into the, came into it currently, or even people researching, and then how did you overcome them? Right. Well, one of the things was initially when people, when we, the community discovered exoplanets, they were big planets, very close to the star. No one thought that technology would get better. You know how it gets better? Like what kind of phone did you have 10, 20, 30 years ago? Oh, and what kind phone. of nothing probably. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you have today? So technology is always getting better. Detectors are getting more sensitive. But at the time, mm -hmm. all we could do was find one type of planet, like a massive or a big planet, very, very close to its host star. So people thought the field would go nowhere because what are you going to do with that? Only big, massive planets. They would say to me, like, why was I studying their atmospheres? Because we could barely detect them 
we're never going to be able, we could barely detect planets themselves. And the atmosphere is so tiny, like the skin of an onion on an onion. People are like, we'll never be able to detect those. And they just couldn't see the field going anywhere. It was cues of, we were cues of stamp collecting. Like you just collect something, not knowing why. <laughs> and people just thought that technology would limit what we could find. And then so, how was that? Yeah. yeah. Like, how was it overcome? And like, and again, like, I know I've asked this a little bit before. I like, how are you currently like overcoming that? Because I, I can imagine back then, you know, people, they thought it was laughable and in, in some, some cases, but then now, like, how are, like, what are those steps that you have to take to, to then really push something forward and new information into the forefront yeah. to get people to really look at it? Right. It's hard. Right. So there were yeah. people, including in Canada, there were um, Professor Gordon Walker, who's now retired, he helped start this whole field. But in Canada, the telescope allocation committee, because it was laughable, they only gave them like a tiny amount of time. And so they didn't find a planet. In retrospect, there was at least one planet in their sample. But it was the people just toiling away, like kind of think of them after hours, working on their own thing. And that eventually gave rise to discovered planet. And then more and more people started going into the field to see if they could find something. And eventually we had enough planets and they were far enough from the star that people had to believe that they were real planets. And I think in this particular case for this field, like just the, it's the enthusiasm that you're showing. Like people were so enthusiastic that, you know, some small fraction of dedicated people, ambitious people went into the field and started finding more and more and inventing clever techniques. And concurrently detectors were getting better. Technology was getting better. Computers were getting faster and able to solve the problems. So as new people went in and toiled away again, you know, for another 10 years and another new way to find planets, eventually things came to fruition. Yeah, I don't know if that was helpful. It was a bit in vague terms, but let's take yeah, NASA's yeah. Kepler Space Telescope that launched exactly. in 2009. So Professor, you know, for um, Dr. Bill Baruki, he had thought of this idea in the 1980s. Okay. Right. And look, it launched in 2009. And he had thought of it well before we had detectors, CCD detectors, like sensitive enough detectors to see a tiny drop in brightness. And he thought of this a very long time ago, but the discovery of exoplanets helped his mission get selected because right. now they're real all of a sudden. And going in space is better than here on earth because of the blurring effects of earth's atmosphere. So having this telescope up in space, it uncovered so many brand new things we didn't expect. Oh, it's unbelievable. Kepler. Yeah, so there's like, People working away, someone making a discovery, attracting more people, you know, very clever, very dedicated people in the field, then getting a lucky break and finding even more and repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. And having somebody, you know, work their entire career around this and dedicated toward it, towards that, I think is unbelievable. I've read that NASA and a lot of other researchers and, and scientists are bringing on people that are younger to work on specific missions for their entire lifespan. Are you wow. seeing that a lot more too? Um, so that, you know, when one person there, you know, they'll be working on something in their career, but they'll actually get to see the end of it, hopefully when their career. Well, finished. oddly enough, it reminds me of a professor at MIT who was a young right. man when the Voyager space telescope Voyager spacecraft launched in the late 1970s. I was actually a child at the time. And mm -hmm. oddly, you remember, in, I don't know if this goes back, but I don't, don't know if anyone watching or if you remember back in the old days, you had the TV and you had the plugged in like big box and you had to press the buttons to change channels. Yes. And that was in the phase I remember, I guess it was like eight years old or something. Maybe I was younger, six or seven. But my dad, what parents want, right, is they want their kid to wake up by themselves and like get breakfast and watch TV on a Saturday because the parent can sleep in. So it was one of these really early mornings. And I was just, every single channel was showing a rocket launch over and over. And I only learned many years later, that was the Voyager launching, the Voyager spacecraft launching, one of them in the 1970s. Well, this professor, he's still around. Now he's an older man, quite old. I don't know how old, but he seems like an older man. He's still alive now and Voyager still sends data back. It's past, it's billions of miles from Earth and it's past the outer edges of our, our solar system. So your story reminds me of that. Bringing someone very young on the project when it launched in the 70s now is still around. Yeah. While still returning a little tiny bit of data. So yeah, we I do have that joke. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. 
No, I, I was saying I have this joke about Kepler where you, know, you get a whole bunch of people before Kepler started sending back data and information that, you know, you'd have the intern or somebody working that was analyzing and following what was going on in other telescopes and other projects. And, you know, the intern got Kepler because nothing maybe was happening. And at one point information's coming back and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I'm like, give the new ones Kepler or sorry, not Kepler, my fault, um, Voyager give the new yeah. ones Voyager. Really um, Voyager is actually one of my favorite missions. Oh, wow. I love it immensely. Um, I always so see amazing. people. Yeah. So it amazing. is. And I'm, I'm you know, that day. That's why I asked about exoplanet images coming back. Cause I can imagine that feeling that they, those people had seeing the first images of other planets in our solar system would have just been unbelievable, you know, and then now, um, seeing, potentially seeing what they'll look like as exoplanets, I think would just be you know, it would almost be the same feeling or, or even more, right? Even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Uh, so with Kepler, Kepler ran out of fuel. Um, why, and I don't, you know, I don't know why they would have done this and why did they create something that would be able to run out of fuel? And I know that I guess it had a longer lifespan than it was expected. And is, there's no way to, you know, refuel it, fuel it up, but what else will Kepler be doing then when it's out there or will it just become space junk? Space junk. Kepler is space junk. But missions are planned oh, so for sad. certain. Yeah, <laughs> missions are planned for a certain lifetime. It's all part of the budget and plan, and so there's a strategy to build something to last a certain number of years. And usually, everything lasts longer because you know you don't want to be the one responsible for it not lasting as long. Yeah, right. Kepler's been an amazing mission, and eventually, it was just um, ran out of fuel. It's too far away for us to communicate with. That's unfortunate. Uh, I read recently in an article saying that evidence of farming on exoplanets should be visible by the James Webb telescope. Do you, do you know anything about that? And, and what would that look like? And what would the evidence be? Can you see that again, evidence of, yeah, it says evidence of farming on exoplanets should be visible by the James Webb telescope. Calling it, um, oh wait. Yeah. I think this is a bit tricky. He's talking about nitrogen oxide like a gas, like remember we were talking about gases that don't belong. Right. And so it looks like they're wanting to see excess amounts of nitrogen oxide, which they're gonna argue has come from farming. So, I mean, all these gases are great. We wanna find gases that are there in much larger quantities than their environment should support. So we'll right. see. We'll see, that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, one of my last questions then for you is about the James Webb telescope again. So they had a, a secret. They were saying that they kept the first image and area a secret. Can you explain why NASA did that? No, I don't know why okay. NASA did that. I know that when I've worked on space telescopes in the past, like people are very cautious because they don't want to make promises that they can't deliver on. So it's always much better to not say anything until it's done and it's fabulous. I a hundred percent agree over deliver. Right. And I think that's, yep. Yeah, I think that's fair because you get a lot of people that would be really upset if um, there was a prediction of something that was going to happen and it didn't uh, more exactly. people would be upset that they would be happy about the new findings. We get right. that in everything. And I think that's just and sadly human. Um, and so before we, before we wrap, I would love to know what you're currently working on right now. If you can tell well, us, believe it or not, I'm currently working on the planet Venus. Awesome. And it's been an incredible journey over the last few years when my team has been working on the search for signs of life and habitability on Venus. Like the surface of Venus is way too hot for life of any kind because Venus has a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse effect. But just like on Earth, I know Toronto is extremely flat, but in other places where you have mountains, you know, yeah. you can hike up a mountain and it gets colder and colder. And so too on Venus, that far above the atmosphere at about 50 kilometers above, it's actually the right temperature for life. Wow. And in fact, it's the same like temperature and pressure that it is here on Earth's surface. And people have been thinking about this for over half a century. But I was involved with this discovery on Venus about phosphine, a gas in the Venus atmosphere that doesn't belong, which has since become incredibly controversial. But it's opened up, like it's shined a new light on Venus. And I've been working on, I've been leading a team to formulate what kind of space missions should we send to Venus that focus on the search for habitable conditions and signs of life? So that's what I've been working on lately. Yeah, that's amazing. And how close are we to sending anything to Venus right now to measure? Well, we have our first uh, privately funded mission. It's a very small mission. It will spend a few minutes in the clouds and it's going to um, search for organic molecules inside the cloud particles. 
And this is a mission with Rocket Lab and its targeted launch date is May, 2023. Wow. That's ex- yeah, that's so exciting. There's and some I other imagine- missions going back to Venus later this decade as well. That won't be focused on astrobiology. It's still too laughable. We we touched on that right. earlier. <laughs> right. But they'll find out. They'll be learning a lot more about Venus. Well, it's beautiful because then you can cross reference, obviously, before you guys launch your mission too. Right. Exactly. Um, is there something that you think that you might find that um, that you might would have never thought? Uh, before? I know that's maybe a little bit of a <laughs> difficult question, but you know, is there something that you're like, or maybe really looking for to find there outside of life? Well, there's something going on. We don't know what we know. There's some very unusual chemistry from measurements from past decades. When we, when NASA and when Russia sent probes directly into the atmosphere, we know there's something right. going on. So we just don't know what. Thank you so much, Sarah. And as I thank say you. to everybody, thank you so much for being rebelliously curious with me. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Bye.